Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on all of these occasions on our heritage.org website. I would ask everyone here in-house to make that courtesy check that your cell phones have been turned off. I see Jim looking at panelists in particular for that. Uh, it is always appreciated as we prepare to begin and, of course, for recording our program. We will post the program on the Heritage homepage for your future reference, and our Internet viewers are always welcome at any time to simply email us with speakers or comments at, uh, at speaker at heritage.org. Hosting our discussion, what do you need? A pen. <laughs> Hosting our discussion today is Dr. James J. Carafano, who serves as Vice President of our Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Institute for National Security and Foreign Policy. He is also our E.W. Richardson Fellow. He serves as a Senior Fellow at the Was George Washington University's Homeland Security Policy Institute on the Board of Trustees of the Marine Corps University Foundation and advisory boards for West Point Center on Oral History, the Hamilton Society, and Operation Renewed Hope Foundation. He also serves a, as president of the nonprofit Esprit de Corps, which educates the public about veterans' affairs. Please join me in welcoming Jim Carafano. Jim. Thank you. First of all, let me thank you all for coming, and, and particularly thank our panelists. I, I've been looking forward to this for a really interesting time. It's a fascinating discussion, and we have people that are out of all sides of this issue, so I'm, I think it's just going to be immensely informative and interesting. So I'm just going to say three things very quickly, and then I'm going to introduce our panelists, and, uh, and then we're going to take the gloves off and, uh, and have that. And uh, you know, much like uh, you know, ultimate fighting thing, there's no rules. <laughs> um, and then we'll, and then we're, we should have. So each panelist is going to talk for seven minutes or so, and then we'll have should have about ten or twenty minutes for for question and answer at the end. And so um, please be thinking of your questions now. And just a reminder when we when we go to the question and answer period, if you do have a question, if you'd raise your hand, because we also tape these and we have online viewers. So if you would wait till I recognize you and then wait for the microphone. Um, and, and particularly in this, we're, we'd be really excited. We'd love to have some questions and discussion. Uh, and then just state your name and affiliation. Uh, that would be great. So I only know three things for sure. Um, we're not very good at this stuff. I mean, I think if you look not just the summer of chaos, but at the, the last decade of um, not just America abroad, but many nations are now trying to do good in the world, it's hard, hard work and it's troubling. Um, the second thing is uh, there's going to be a lot more of this. Uh, I think the, the need for a benevolent force in the world to try to help people's lives better is not just to improve their own existence, but to, uh, um, to create this virtuous circle of, of growing areas of peace and prosperity and, and stability. Um, there's going to be a, a greater demand for that, not less. And, uh, and the third thing is, is just having good, I don't think just having good intentions keeps you safe. Uh, this notion that somehow because you're neutral, um, you, you, it gives you some kind of um, leg up in terms of operating in areas of, of conflict and instability. Uh, if it ever was true, I think it's increasingly not true. And, and the, the recent incident of two reporters and an uh, um, aid worker being beheaded um, who were in the classically classic role of, of neutral parties, I think just reflective of how not only does neutrality not maybe defend you anymore, but it actually makes you a, a, a target and a victim. So I, I, don't, I have to be honest, I don't know the way forward. And I, I can't actually think of more, uh, four people I would rather hear from more to, to kind of talk about this and help us think thoughtfully about what the way forward might, might be. So I'm just going to you know, introduce them all very briefly. And, uh, and then we'll just, I guess, talk in order. And then when we're done, we'll go to Q&A. So Jim Hake is a uh, technology and media entrepreneur. And in 2003, he founded a group called Spirit of America and currently serves as its Chief Executive Officer. Um, he is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He's lectured on entrepreneurship at the, the Tuck School of Business and a number of other places. He's, he's given an awesome TED Talk. So if you, haven't, if, you know, if you don't know what a TED Talk is, shame on you. You should find out what TED Talks are. Download the app, and then you should watch Jim's because it's really entertaining. Um, he's talked at the Bush School, the Aspen School. Um, the the uh, Spirit of America has done some amazing work in some very dangerous parts of the world. He has his BA from uh, Dartmouth and an MBA from Stanford University, but we'll forgive him for that. Well, they just beat Army 35 nothing, so no love lesson. Uh, Jenny McAvoy is currently the interaction 
currently Interactions Director of Protection, responsible for developing and leading collaborative efforts of Interactions members and other interagency fora to enhance humanitarian protection. Her expertise and current focus encompass policy and programming which supports results-based approaches to protection, strengthening compliance with international human rights law and human rights throughout the humanitarian action uh, and um, UN, UN integration policy and also the protection of civilians in armed conflict. So you couldn't ask for a better expert to, teach us to deal with the issue. Before that, she worked for the OC, OCHA policy branch, protection and displacement section, and uh, she previously worked 13 years in local, national, international NGOs and pioneered Oxfam's work on the protection of civilians in armed conflict. And she will be followed by the smartest woman in the world. Nadia Shadlow is the senior program officer at the Smith Richardson uh, Foundation, where she identifies issues that warrant further attention from U.S. policy community and manages and develops programs and projects related to these issues. Um, she is a, she has served on the Defense Policy Board. Uh, she's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. She did a masterful dissertation on War and the Art of Governance, the U.S. Army's role in military government from the Mexican War to Operation Just Cause. Um, she writes brilliantly on these issues, recently had an article in Parameters, a BA from Cornell, an MA and PhD from Johns Hopkins, and um, a great, just a, a good person and a great friend. But you don't have to be nice for it just because I said it. Um, Anne Ralty has served 30 years in, of international development experience, uh, 15 years at USAID, where she coordinated interagency and agency-level strategic planning, performance management, and formulation of policy. She was the senior policy advisor for the office of the chief operating officer, uh, where she led uh, formulation of USAID's policies and implementa implementation of guidelines on civil and military cooperation. Um, she... Uh, she was part of the USAID team and policy team in 2006 that established the State Department's Office of the Director of Foreign Assistance. Uh, she, she also worked in the Bureau of Humanitarian Response, the Office of Food for Peace, technical advisor to World Health Organization and director of the Helen Keller International Global Vitamin A Program and the UNICEF Cambodian Health um, Advisor. And she is currently the director of monitoring and evaluation of international relief and development, a nonprofit NGO based in Arlington. So I want to thank um, Dana and uh, Alexis who helped uh, organize this panel because what you have here is an incredible breadth of experience, uh, both operationally and intellectually. You couldn't really ask um, for a better group to, to grapple with this really difficult and important issue. So I'm going to turn over to Jim. You can either, <clears throat> if you guys, it's really up to you. You can talk from there if you wish or or come up to the podium, whichever you're more comfortable with. And then when we're done with our comments, we'll jump to Q&A. So thanks again. So Jim, over to you. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> um, I'll stay seated. So I'm going to uh, talk about a, a new model of private assistance that is especially important in today's security environment. And it's one that's been pioneered by Spirit of America. Uh, I'm, first, a little background uh, for those not familiar with uh, universal humanitarian principles, they grow out of the work, uh, this is um, among experts on this subject, so I'll, I'll try to do it justice, uh, grew out of the work of the Red Cross. They were adopted by the UN General Assembly in 1992, uh, and there are four uh, principles that are, are universal humanitarian principles. One is neutrality, which uh, means that an organization that adheres to these principles does not take sides in any conflict or controversy. Uh, independence, which means that an organization should uh, provide its assistance independent of any military, political, or economic objective, uh, impartiality, and, of course, humanity. Uh, so these were uh, developed and, and grew out of some really important motivations, which uh, uh, I'm sure Jenny will talk about, were largely associated with the protection of humanitarian personnel operating in various war zones and conflict areas uh, in various parts of the world. So um, those are the, the principles. I'll refer to them a little bit. I'm sure uh, others will as well. Uh, so that's some background on that. Uh, with respect to Spirit of America, I founded the organization in response to the attacks of 9-11. Of so, and it was long before I had any idea about what universal humanitarian principles were or had even really heard of them. 
my background was in the private sector, as Jim mentioned, as an internet and technology entrepreneur. I had no government, military, uh, NGO, or nonprofit experience. So either perfectly suited or imperfectly suited for, for the work that we're doing as Spirit of America. Uh, so we're a privately funded nonprofit organization, and we only provide assistance, humanitarian, economic, and, and civic assistance in response to needs identified by U.S. personnel, deployed U.S. personnel operating in places from Afghanistan to West Africa, Central South America, and, and so on. So everything we do is in response to needs they identify and in support of their missions. Uh, in that, um, we, as I've come to understand it, are not neutral uh, in that we take a side. We take the side of the U.S. troops and diplomats that we hear from and the local people and partners that they seek to help. And we don't, as I said, provide assistance unless it is supportive of their efforts and supportive of the people that they're trying to help. Um, I'm going to give a couple of examples of how this works, and it's a very, again, unconventional model. Uh, but my idea in founding the organization was to really help uh, both our nation, uh, our partners and allies, and the ideals for which we stand prevail against very uh, groups of people who have very different ideas of the way the future should be. Let's put it that way. So uh, it, just two quick examples. Uh, our personnel, they're all military veterans uh, themselves, uh, U.S. military veterans, work alongside U.S. troops and diplomats. Uh, there are two of them pictured in, in each of these photographs. Uh, in Panjway, Afghanistan, uh, that's a Jim Basenchek, a, a Marine veteran, uh, who was, we were the first non-governmental organization into Panjway uh, shortly after, as you may recall, uh, the uh, soldier, U.S. soldier, uh, there was a terrible tragedy where the soldier massacred 16 people in the middle of the night. So after that, Panjway, which was known as the birthplace of the Taliban, was an especially challenging area. Uh, in combination with U.S. Army and Special Operations Forces, uh, we focused our support in that area over a period of a year. And for the vast majority of that time, we're the, we were the only non-governmental organization in there. In part, we were able to do that because we were as closely linked with the U.S. and the U.S. military specifically as one could be. Uh, so in this case, Jim is uh, uh, working on the demonstration of uh, a water filtration system that had many reasons why that was a, a project that we were asked to help with. Uh, in West Africa, in the photograph there, the fellow with the hat is also one of our field team. Uh, he is uh, alongside a U.S. Army captain. Uh, Mauritania, uh, in this case, was a really interesting example where Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb in uh, the eastern part of Mauritania had been very problematic, uh, let's say, as they had been in Mali, which led to the rebellion and the war in Mali. So from a U.S. perspective, the goal was stability and resilience in uh, a very challenging part of, of the country. Now, in, in Mauritania, there's not an active war going on, and the goal, of course, is to keep challenging situations from getting worse so that they never appear in the headlines. Um, in this case, uh, the key action that we took as Spirit of America was to address livestock health as the number one uh, need and issue and concern of the local population. Uh, we took an approach where we funded the training and equipping of locally chosen men to go into for-profit businesses as veterinarians uh, in order to meet their village's biggest needs and in doing so, uh, provide a, a measure of a resilience to AQIM, and also to uh, strengthen the ties between those villages and the regional and national government and the Mauritanian military. Uh, that project is still going on. Uh, the veterinarians are uh, actually making money, and, uh, which is a beautiful thing, and uh, more importantly, uh, improving the security and stability of a very challenging area. Uh, so in all those cases, um, uh, as I said, we are, our personnel are working side by side with U.S. <coughs> military and civilian personnel in direct support of their objectives and in support of the local people and populations that they're trying to help. Um, so uh, we've provided this kind of support in over 30 different countries over the last 10 or so years. Those are some of them. And uh, as we got into this, uh, again, uh, as it turns out, 
Our approach uh, doesn't adhere to or violates three out of four of the universal humanitarian principles that I mentioned earlier. And I would say that's neither a good nor a bad thing. It just, it just is, is what it is. It's an objective, uh, objective fact. And um, what, what uh, I've come to understand is that there's a, a place and a role for this not neutral approach that helps fill some of the gaps that exist especially in U.S. military activity abroad. And in some of the countries, you know, maybe in West Africa that I mentioned, it may be surprising that, you know, there are U.S. military personnel there uh, and uh, uncertainty about what they're doing. But long and short of it is they, those you know, small teams are working to prevent the kind of things that we've seen in the headlines recently. So prevent small problems from cascading into big problems. They're operating in areas which from a, a traditional standpoint are not safe for conventional uh, organizations. So both in Padway, as I mentioned, and in West Africa, places where we're providing this assistance, uh, there are no other uh, NGOs operating, um, at least not in the period in which we were, we were uh, active with them. So uh, the core of this, in, in my view, is that uh, I don't think uh, not neutral is better than neutral. The, the real uh, conclusion that I've come to is that as part of an ecosystem, because I would say both in this case, the not neutral organizations like us and the neutral organizations uh, like those that are, are part of uh, interaction uh, that Jenny will talk about are broadly speaking, working in very much the same direction and, and share the same objectives. So uh, my view is that this, uh, this not neutral approach, which is new compared to the, the okay. neutral approach, is a critical part of the ecosystem for trying to achieve the objectives that I think everyone in this room would say that we share. Uh, one thing on the not neutral side is that our adversaries and enemies have this idea of private assistance, not neutral private assistance, uh, well in hand, very well figured out. So the US Treasury has identified 56 so-called charities that are linked to and channel, have channeled uh, funds to foreign terrorist organizations. There are uh, what I'll refer to as uh, individual or maybe, uh, uh, let's call them individual operations based largely in social media that also raise money. They don't, they're not formal charities, they're not formal organizations. These are individual actors raising money and applying them to our, our adversaries and enemies. Uh, one featured in the New York Times uh, back in November. Uh, uh, Sheikh uh, linked to Al Qaeda, who had a campaign called "Wage Wage Jihad with Your Money." Um, people donated uh, funds, and you achieved gold status with about $150, which would buy a certain number of sniper rounds, and uh, you know, gold, uh, gold or platinum uh, status. I forget which uh, would buy mortar rounds. So this is what's working on the other side of the equation. Uh, it was just recently published that. Uh, ISIS had raised, in its earlier days, hundreds of millions of dollars from individuals in the Gulf, uh, you know, again, private assistance that was unrestricted and unfettered <laughs> that helped it snowball into the problem that we see today. Now, all the assistance that we provide on our non-neutral side is, uh, of course, non-lethal. Uh, it's all to actually help people achieve the better lives that the vast majority of people aspire to. Uh, but we need an answer to what's happening on the adversarial side. So in summary then, uh, you know, I think it, the security challenges that we see today require new approaches, new models of, of doing things. Uh, that doesn't mean we get rid of the old ones, but uh, there are certain new approaches which are a good idea. There, and one of those new approaches I would say is neutral plus not neutral in the same way that private plus public is a key to being able to have the flexibility and agility to deal with these very, very challenging, uh, quite messy and, and dynamic situations. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Jenny. Jenny. Thanks very much. Um, and thanks very much to the Heritage Foundation for hosting this conversation. Um, I very much hope that um, I'll be asked back <laughs> after this well, and that uh, we, we can continue this conversation um, because I suspect um, there, there are a number of challenging issues here 
and uh, we won't be able to resolve them, I think, satisfactorily today. Um, and indeed, they're complex enough that, that they deserve, they, they warrant exactly this kind of attention. Um, I, I suspect, um, having, having heard Jim's um, uh, sort of scoping out uh, of the issues, that in fact we may sort of come to some kind of conclusion that perhaps we may be talking about different objectives. Um, I'm, I'm not so sure that we actually are talking about the same objective. Um, so I'm going to walk through, um, from a humanitarian perspective, um, our approach to some of these questions um, and set out a, a little bit about our experience, uh, what we observe, uh, what some of the challenges are, and um, try to leave enough time for some discussion, um, because that will certainly be interesting. Um, so in the first instance, um, perhaps I, sh I should establish that for, for the purpose of humanitarian action, uh, from our perspective, is to save lives and to alleviate human suffering. Um, it is not to solve the conflict. It is not to resolve the underlying issues that give rise to conflict, um, nor deal with the issues that are being politically contested in the conflict. Um, the objectives are genuinely very simple, to save lives and alleviate human suffering. Um, secondly, just to briefly note that natural disasters, um, the other type of context where we operate, are usually fairly straightforward. Um, they can have their own difficulties and complexities, but for the most part, um, all actors or most actors are very much oriented towards the same goal. Everyone's working towards dealing with the effects of, of a disaster. Therefore, neutrality mainly concerns situations of armed conflict. Um, and our, our starting point is what it actually takes to be able to operate effectively in the exceptionally violent and exceptionally volatile situations of armed conflict as humanitarians. So how do we need to be able to operate as humanitarians? Um, secondly, as, as Jim very aptly laid out, neutrality is one of four humanitarian principles. These are widely recognized, formally endorsed by states, um, as essential to the character of humanitarian action. Um, I also want to note that based on our experience, these principles are interdependent. Um, and I suspect this could be a long conversation between Jim and I about you know, whether or not they, they are indeed interdependent. In our experience, they are. Whereby, if you don't adhere to one principle, you're going to find it very difficult to fulfill another. Um, so just to briefly recap um, the definitions of these principles, humanity means we will respond to human suffering wherever it is found. Impartiality means that assistance is provided on the basis of need alone, on the basis of human need to be able to survive. Uh, no distinction made on the basis of age, gender, ethnicity, race, uh, political or religious beliefs, what have you. Uh, neutrality means we will not take sides in hostilities um, or engage in, in controversies of a political, racial, religious, or ideological character. Um, independence means we will operate autonomously um, from the objectives of other actors. Um, so focusing in then on neutrality, um, and I have to say it, it can sound a bit misleading. We refer to neutrality as a principle, which sounds very lofty and very abstract and perhaps a little bit holier than thou. Um, in reality, uh, neutrality is very tactical for us, very practical, and very much an operational matter. Um, now, our, our role as international humanitarian actors working in situations of armed conflict is set out in the law of armed conflict, um, or international humanitarian law, um, or IHL. Um, now, the law of armed conflict is, is present throughout US military doctrine, and indeed, the US has been one of the main contributors um, to this body of law, um, stretching back to the US Civil War. Um, so this is the body of law that recognizes that armed conflict does occur, um, and it seeks to find a balance between military necessity on one hand and 
considerations of humanity um, on the other. Um, so this is the body of law that governs the conduct um, of the parties to conflict and also sets out the parameters for our role as humanitarians. Uh, so remembering that the first obligation to ensure that protected persons, including civilians, um, are treated properly during times of war lies with the parties to conflict, yeah? The state and the non-state parties. They have the primary obligation to ensure that protected persons are treated properly. Um, the role of external actors, such as ourselves as, as humanitarian organizations, comes into play if these parties are unwilling or unable to fulfill these obligations. And at that point, we may offer our services. International humanitarian law or the law of war says an impartial humanitarian organization may offer its services in order that this obligation be met. Um, so right away, we have two criteria that we need to meet. It must be impartial, and it must be humanitarian in character. If it is not impartial, if it is not humanitarian in character, the parties to conflict may say thanks, but no thanks. They may reject our offer of services. Then comes the question, uh, the, the other thing, in addition to uh, IHL saying we may offer our services, this service is subject to the consent of, of the parties. So then comes the question, how do we obtain that consent from the parties? Now, let's keep in mind that even if uh, IHL or, or the law of armed conflict did not specify this, consent would still be a practical necessity. Um, assuming the party to conflict controls a territory, assuming the party to conflict um, has the ability to interfere with humanitarian action, Consent is still going to be needed as a, as a very practical operational matter. Um, and this is where neutrality comes in. Um, given that the parties to conflict are involved in a, a conflict over some politically contested issue, it's reasonable um, for them to expect that our activities not interfere with their political and military objectives including our activities, how we operate, um, et cetera. They, it's reasonable for them to expect that our actions will not give a military advantage to their opponent. Yeah. So as a matter of military necessity, um, they will expect this. Now, if they do believe that our actions will allow a military advantage to their opponents, as a matter of military necessity, they would be um, on legitimate grounds to refuse our service and deny our access uh, to vulnerable people. So if we didn't insist on neutrality, we're setting ourselves up to fail. In practice, this means being highly transparent um, about our activities with all parties while refraining from engaging um, on the ideological or political issues that are being contested um, in that conflict. It means refraining from aligning ourselves or appearing to be aligned um, with any one political actor or party. Um, now, this does not mean avoiding engagement with political and military actors. And indeed, continuous dialogue with political and military actors um, in that operational setting can be essential to achieving humanitarian outcomes. Um, but it's a challenge of managing those relationships in such a way that ensures that we are not seen as favoring one party or another. Uh, for example, if, if more than one party is responsible for impeding humanitarian access, we must admonish all, all parties and remind them of their obligations to facilitate access um, and not just one side. An additional implication um, is that if we do not properly demonstrate neutrality, we fall short of ensuring that our humanitarian aid is impartial. Um, in effect, we would create the conditions whereby our services benefit a portion of the population based on ethnic, political, religious, or, or other factors while allowing a portion of the, of the population to be excluded um, and to be deprived um, of resources necessary for their survival. And that translates into hundreds of thousands of people left without emergency medical care, without clean water, without basic necessities, the things that would assure their survival as long as that, that conflict is ongoing. Um, and this negates the entirety of our purpose as humanitarians. 
Um, so our neutrality with respect to the issues of political controversy in that conflict enables us to make the case for impartial humanitarian aid, aid based on need alone. So for example, in, in Peshawar, in, in Pakistan, the, the army issues no objection certificates uh, to humanitarian NGOs if they believe that NGO is trustworthy and transparent. Uh, the Taliban um, is, is notorious for, for vetting um, organizations. Um, traditionally, they've been amenable, amenable to permitting humanitarian activities, but they're also intensely suspicious of organizations that only work in government-controlled areas. Um, they're also suspicious of those that implement poor quality programs, as they assume this means that the organization is, in fact, collecting intelligence and is not there to assist the, the local population. So this flags an additional risk um, as it relates to neutrality, and that is that populations who, populations may be violently punished um, if they are seen as supplying intelligence to or receiving assistance from an organization that is believed to be partisan. Um, and this is something that we've, we've seen occur. Um, now, punishing a civilian population would be an unlawful act, uh, but it doesn't mean that a government or a, a non-state party to conflict wouldn't do it. Um, and obviously, this is precisely the scenario we'd, we'd like to avoid. Um, in around 2008, 2009, uh, the Taliban began implementing a vetting scheme whereby they would detain and interview um, aid workers in order to determine whether they were pursuing a, a political agenda through their programs or whether, in fact, they had a strict humanitarian and nonpartisan purpose. Um, a, a recent study by the Humanitarian Policy Group in the UK found that a number of non-state armed groups um, in various countries around the world, in fact, have quite sophisticated approaches to monitoring the work of humanitarian organizations. Um, I highly recommend their, their studies, by the way. Very interesting. Now, there are some organizations who get by in some situations without actually investing in, in good practice to ensure their neutrality and to be seen as neutral. So it's understandable um, if sometimes it appears that neutrality is not relevant anymore. Um, but what, what are the consequences uh, that we experience from this? Um, if a member of the community is viewed as political or partial um, or, or biased. Um, and as I've mentioned, we've seen punishment of vulnerable people, widespread suspicion of humanitarian organizations, denial of access to affected populations, targeted attacks on humanitarian workers, manipulation and diversion of aid to serve political goals, um, and so on. Now, keeping in mind that armed conflict is volatile, uh, with frequent fluctuations in dynamics, new resources uh, come in um, or are depleted, territory changes hands, alliances between parties are formed or break down, armed groups become fragmented, and, and so on. Um, our ability to maintain access um, and to manage our own security in these situations completely breaks down if we're seen as having a politically partisan motive driving our work and our actions. Um, indeed, and we see in a number of situations where parties to conflict believe that those claiming to be humanitarian are in fact collecting information to be passed on to another party to conflict. And we end up being blamed for events, uh, for events that we have nothing to do with or are out of our control. For example, being blamed for providing intelligence that, that lead to airstrikes. Um, and in fact, uh, a number of expulsions of organizations in South Central Somalia occurred under these circumstances. Um, just to wrap up, um, it's, it's notable that the organizations who proactively and conscientiously maintain a neutral posture and actively maintain ongoing liaison with all parties to conflict are the organizations able to sustain access even under these trying circumstances. Um, and it's worth remembering that our reputations as humanitarians are not just local, they are global. Um, we have to assume that our behavior in Somalia is being observed in Mali that our behavior in Syria is being observed in Iraq, and so on. 
Um, to sum up, if, if we allow aid and services intended to save lives and alleviate human suffering to be rechanneled for political purposes, we give up on ensuring that we have full access um, to everyone who needs assistance, no matter under whose control uh, they happen to find themselves. Uh, we effectively turn our backs um, on the vulnerable population. We put our own staff at, at great risk and we negate our entire purpose. Um, and then the, the question is, so who would feel, fill that role? If we do not insist on neutrality, who will fill that role to ensure that people do not suffer unnecessarily and stand a chance um, of surviving uh, a conflict? Thank you. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> um, I'm going to start out first by saying that I'm not um, an implementer, and I have not uh, had operational experience like a lot of my fellow colleagues here, so I'm not saying that I do. I'm, I'm approaching this as someone who's thought about these issues from a policy perspective and thought about them in terms of how can the U.S. best achieve its outcomes, which I think are decent outcomes and good ones, and end up helping societies in many of the same ways that my fellow panelists have talked about. Um, I don't expect us all to agree, as Jenny said. Hopefully the idea is to generate debate and address a topic that I think is actually relatively new. I don't think this is a topic that's been talked about that much before, and so I think it's interesting and exciting to be a part of it, and thank you everyone for, for coming. Um, I actually uh, started out with the same point as Jenny, but from a perspective of being a problem. So I'm going to go through four <laughs> four problems um, that I see with the concept of neutrality. But we and we didn't plan it at all. But the very first problem is first, the neutrality is fundamentally a tactical concept. Um, so I would argue that there are probably short time periods, very short time periods, where you might talk about pure neutrality, perhaps during a health crisis. But even then, once Reconstruction starts, once a long-term effort to alleviate suffering begins, everything becomes political fast. There are vested interests. There are actors competing for aid, competing for money. It becomes local contested competitions. And um, I think, therefore, to talk about the neutral space is such a narrow space that it leads one to question the utility of it over time. Furthermore, I'd argue even in health crisis situations, such as the polio crisis, back, um, in which, which has been a problem in, in parts of Africa and Pakistan, it's resurgence, aid workers come in, and they are attacked and killed by entities that see them as, um, you know, Islamist entities went in and killed aid workers because of their affiliation with the West and the, the belief that what was being injected in children were not actually polio vaccines. So again, even in these purely health crisis situations, I think it's hard to find a truly neutral space. Even now with the Ebola crisis, what's happening? It's a health crisis, but now it's also a profoundly political problem. It's working with governments, it's working with actors, it's developing organizations for quarantine. So again, um, I see this as, as not purely a neutral space to work in, but a whole range of interrelated activities and interests are at work that I think it's important to consider to get to the outcomes you want. Um, the second sort of problem that I see with neutrality is, um, again, related to this tactical level, it makes it difficult to align with U.S. interests in a real, meaningful, operational, and strategic way. Now, I know this is not actually the goal of, I mean, from the interactions perspective, I think um, the opposite point would be, well, our goal is not to align with U.S. interests or foreign policy. But from the U.S. side, it is a stated goal to work in a public-private way with entities on the ground in humanitarian situations. So my point for this, for that, this point is more for U.S. policymakers to think about. If part of what state and AID are saying is very important and central to their ability to operationalize and implement their programs, it's working with actors, many of whom are, are have signed up to principles that are actually not necessarily consistent with with um, what the U.S. wants to do on the ground. Not all, not all the time, but it's an area that I think. Uh, the state and AID professionals need to think about, need to explore, and need to understand so that the partners that they're working with on the ground are ones that have aligned with U.S. interests. And in the QDDR, and there are different documents that point to this, so I'm happy to talk about that. Um, 
I'd also argue that when AID was set up in 1961, if you go back and look at some of its founding principles, um, reducing poverty, advancing democracy, empowering women, building market economies, promoting security, responding to crises, all of these, I think, are, are squarely in the humanitarian space, I would argue, but are also very, um, also squarely in the space of politics, essentially. Um, again, aside from very short periods of time, to alleviate suffering over a longer, more extended period of time, these other issues need to be dealt with. Um, third, and this is sort of new, so I'm not sure it's, it's necessarily right, and I'd like to hear from other people in the audience, especially those with, um, you have experience working in other cultures and speak other languages, but I suspect it's also a very um, Western concept in terms of thinking about the ideas of neutrality. Um, other languages, I did a completely non, you know, empirical, not, not a big data collection effort, but asked a few friends, so what is the word for neutrality in Chinese? Uh, the, the technical translation is apolitical, which actually puts it squarely in the political space, and it's seen as a very narrow, almost impossible space to operate in. Um, in Arabic, and I'm sure there are different words for this, and depending on the culture in the country, um, one of the words is, um, supposedly it means self-removal from partisan stands. So it has connotations often which are usually negative, um, where non-engagement and, and centricism are often seen as indecision, weakness, and a lack of social responsibility. Now, this information might not be correct, but I do think it's worth looking at. There are probably some interns in the room. I think it would make you know, an interesting little essay to see how other cultures think about this word and the term and the way that it's used. Um, local groups that claim neutrality in other cultures are often not accepted as such and are, in fact, regarded suspiciously. And I think actually this aligns with Jenny's points. We're just coming at it from a different perspective. So I would argue that whatever is done, they're not going to be trusted anyway. And they're going to be seen as agents of one country or another, one regional or local power as another. So it's hard, again, to operate in that purely neutral space. Um, I think also that groups with decidedly political aims operate in this space and derive the political benefits of that actually in ways that are, uh, that, that are more successful than what the U.S. has done. So in Pakistan, in the areas that were hit by the earthquakes and the floods, Jamayat al-Dawa, uh, which is a Diobandi Salafi group, worked very effectively in the humanitarian space use that effectiveness to build a basis of political support which still exist and which still create problems now with overall U.S. goals in Pakistan for helping to uh, create more successful societies, again, that, that are, um, have ideals that I think are actually consistent with most of the humanitarian groups working. So they use the space in a more, I would say, sophisticated way because they build on the political foundations th that that space provides. Um, Fourth, and I guess I don't, you know, my, my comments are maybe shorter than I thought, and I, I've posed them deliberately sort of as a series of questions, because as I've said, I, I do think these are issues that I haven't completely worked out. To go back to um, James's point early on, I don't know the answer to all these, these questions, and I, I do understand the problem from Jenny's perspective, but I also think the outcomes that we might want to achieve um, might be we might have more success with them if we think about this in a different way or think about new operating models. Um, so related to all these points is my, my last point, which is what is good and ethical about neutrality? I mean, and, and I think that that's a legitimate question. It might not be a popular one, but I think it's legitimate. Does it equate two sides that are in fact not equal at all? They're not equal. The Taliban is not equal to other actors working in, in the country. ISIS is not equal to other actors operating in their space. Um, what is the relationship between justice and neutrality? Again, is it a Western concept? Is it rooted in the Enlightenment, in liberalism? I'm not sure, looking back. Um, depending on, on how, how you think about the term, what are its antecedents for being a, considered a good concept? Lots of people don't think Switzerland was a particularly good actor in World War II, right? Depending on how you think about it. Um, is cooperation with really bad actors justifiable beyond any, you know, certain point, at what point does it become justifiable to continue it? Um, so again, I think these are maybe sensitive questions, but I think it's worth thinking about. Um, are there activities on an individual or small group level that might be just for that 
local immediate space, but communally, at the communal level, not advancing the sort of justice that um, that NGOs in the humanitarian space really fundamentally want, right? They want women to be treated decently and empowered and children to have access to medical care and better health. So are there differences uh, where neutrality works maybe at an individual, very localized level, but beyond that, it doesn't work as well or it creates limitations to what can actually be done? Um, are there specific examples of successes that are fundamentally due to neutrality or are they due more to compromises that have been made among competing political and economic interests? So if I had to think of an alternative framework, mine would actually be the latter. The compromises that need to be made between competing political, economic, social, religious interests on the ground. And thinking of it more in the political sense in the way that our Congress is, is compromising all the time. Um, so what's the difference between thinking about compromise and neutrality and operationalizing those ideas? I think that would also be interesting for discussion. Um, I think then if we think about neutrality in a different way or begin to question that assumption, that leads to other questions. Are there different information requirements that NGOs um, might seek? Would their operational planning be different? Um, would links between tactical accomplishments and strategic goals be stronger if politics were explicitly discussed at the outset? Would you see more long-term benefits down the line? Um, I think these are the kinds of questions that, that we would ask and, and you know, debate um, in the NGO community. I think it would be interesting actually to do so. Um, Save the Children uh, has, has a phrase which I found which I thought was interesting and I think kind of illustrates the point or my point of difference. Um, maybe with Jenny, um, it's noted, we live in a world where we know how to prevent extreme hunger, yet people still die from a lack of food. Um, now I think that perfectly illustrates that it's not a humanitarian problem, but it's essentially a people one, it's a political one, and that for a whole bunch of interrelated reasons, um, that I would argue that that would be defined as not a humanitarian problem, but essentially a political problem of how to build successful societies and successful states that can feed people, because in many of these places we know how to do this. Um, it's just all of these other interests that affect our ability to achieve those outcomes. So um, sort of those are my four points. Probably the panelists to my right and left completely disagree with me, but that actually makes it fun. I mean, in, in Washington, it's I think sometimes, you know, it's actually fun to, to disagree and talk about these ideas. Um, and I look forward to it, so thank you. I'm kind of glad we did this without lunch and silverware. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm over to you. What's interesting is I agreed with everything she said. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Rats. <laughs> and? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your kind invitation to be on this panel, and I hope I will be invited back. Um, because I will be sharing my personal views that, that have been shaped by my work at USAID, where I served as senior policy advisor on humanitarian assistance and civilian military assistance. So I have the advantage of looking at the point of view of our NGO practitioners and all their problems, and having to solve this with our DOD colleagues. So I would be the one that's sort of the balancing of the two points of view, and I may have an approach that might work for both sides. So, the, but for today's purposes, the definition I will be using, again, is what Jenny has already explained. It says neutrality is not favoring any side of an armed <coughs> conflict or other dispute, okay? So that's where I'm coming from. And then, of course, to me, personally, again, um, what is the purpose of these principles? It is to be need, uh, humanitarian aid is to be based on need and need alone. So it doesn't seem to be connecting with the US government policies, but I will show you how at USAID we were able to walk the fine walk of these discussions. As Jenny mentioned, for humanitarian assistance, natural disasters, it's very clear. There is uh, the OFTA uh, DART team that the response is triggered by requests from the host nation through the chief of mission. So where it tends to become blurry is in complex crises, as in Afghanistan. And we've looked at many, many different issues, and as you know, standing up the PRT was quite problematic for USAID and civil and agencies that did not have the capacity, really, to take the lead in development. DOD wanted us to take the lead, but we did not have the capacity. 
So, and one of the issues we found time and time again was the lack of a clear means of communication with each other. And inherent in the weakness is the lack of a common lexicon. So we speak different languages. And this is, again, the problem with what we're looking at today is the definition of humanitarian assistance. Uh, Title 10 definition of humanitarian, uh, humanitarian assistance is very different from how civilian agencies define it. The DOD's definition is much wider. And it may include activities that we in the development space will call development. But however, even in these circumstances, it is possible to operate uh, with clear guidelines if clear guidelines are provided by our senior leadership from both sides of the aisle. And I have found that building a positive working relationship is key, starting at the top leadership level and also built from the ground up from people working together in the field. So in 2008, under the able leadership of Henrietta Four and Secretary Gates, USAID, State Department, and DOD started working on the blurring of lines issue, especially in shared space, to find what we call actionable, practical solutions. Our work was formalized through the Interagency Development Policy Coordinating Committee, or PCC, chaired by USAID, and we established the Civilian Military Subcommittee to address whole of government 3D issues on three topics. Uh, strategic planning, security sector reform, and humanitarian assistance. As you can imagine, most of the heated conversation was on the definition of humanitarian assistance and the respective motivations for humanitarian aid. So we got around the definition issue for the purpose of our working group by calling humanitarian assistance disaster response. <laughs> that was our agreement for the sake of the working group. So our efforts resulted in DOD's policy guidance for its overseas humanitarian disaster and civic aid, or ODACA program, that call for these activities to supplement or complement, but not duplicate or replace the efforts of other US government agencies that have primary responsibility for providing foreign assistance. We also encourage the early engagement of USAID in identifying and designing activities. And earlier this year, to in uh, June, DOD issued a similar policy guidance for its humanitarian and civic assistance activities. So these efforts are continuing, and the guidance and, inst and policy instructions have strengthened collaboration on the ground and also ensuring neutrality. Uh, for example, USAID's policy on civilian military cooperation and its internal guidelines, which are um, not released to the public because of um, uh, sensitive issues, helped us to clarify the red lines for field staff to maintain our neutrality. And again, as you mentioned, these are mostly tactical and operational issues. So, so um, where I come from, in my work at USAID, you know, we re recognize the need to bring all of these what we call tools, smart power, that underscores the need for a very strong military, but also invests in development and alliances and partnerships and institutions at all levels, starting at the community-based level. So how do we actually use these various tools together in practical terms? And how do we actually maintain and strengthen our principles? while trying to do this. So Jim asked for a new, some new approaches and models. There is one operational concept that was advanced by Ruben Brigitte, who used to work for the Center for American Progress. And he drew distinctions between what he called fundamental and instrumental, instrumental civilian assistance. So with my very minor tweaks, the concept is as follows. The only purpose of fundamental assistance is the improvement of the lives of the benef beneficiary population as a goal in and of itself. So the key question in this scenario would be, what is the humanitarian need? <coughs> it sees assistance through a humanitarian mindset, a mindset or neutrality lens. The degree of success in meeting people's needs after a disaster or 
during a conflict would be the primary indicator for accountability and for measuring success. Now, instrumental assistance seeks to provide tangible improvements to the beneficiary population for the express purpose of, of advancing security interests at the tactical or strategic level. So the key question here would be, what is the threat? It uses a security mindset or wider DOD and US government objectives. <clears throat> so besides providing beneficiary level indicators, success, success would be measured by other indicators including reduced level of violence and so on. So to me, the principle of neutrality is more critical than ever. Our increasingly chaotic world demands principled actions and continued US leadership as the lead donor in humanitarian assistance to provide transparent humanitarian relief based on need. Humanitarian assistance based on need best exemplifies the traditional American value of helping those less fortunate. This is the one value that resonates with everyday people around the world, irrespective of religious beliefs or other differences. This is why people like me, coming from a different culture, were proud to serve at USAID, so we could be part of the solution. And yes, in other cultures, we do understand that basic value. While neutrality may seem compromised in complex operations, this provides a shared common base for humanitarian aid and accountability, which is also important, across all donors and implementing partners. So the two forms of foreign aid we were talking about really can complement each other. What I, what I have found in working with NGOs and uh, DOD and other organizations is that an enabling environment where we have mutual respect for our respective institutions and differences and good working relationships at all levels are the building blocks. There, and there are practical approaches. Uh, the concepts of fundamental versus instrumental could be further tested and piloted. So as a start, clarity of purpose and of motivations for US interventions would foster understanding and transparency, giving the opportunity for NGOs to decide with full information and understanding whether or not to be engaged. So one of the lessons learned from the December 2004 tsunami disaster is the need to develop an aid, another additional aid principle based on the right to seek, receive, and impact information, which would establish freedom of information regarding all disaster response efforts. And this came from the Tsunami Evaluation Coalition in 2006. So especially in politically charged situations, it is vital that donors and partners maintain transparency in their decision making and response. And not to get too technical, but I am an m and &E specialist. There are standard international agreed tools to determine <coughs> purpose and goals. For example, during assessments and project design, the theory of change analysis, or what we call development hypotheses, requires corresponding activities and relevant performance indicators or metrics that send a very clear signal of the intended outcome. So finally, NGOs are guided by their own organization's interpretation and application of neutrality principle, including, including those who have a more pragmatic approach rather than a strict ideological stance. However, what really motivates humanitarian action is what binds us all together, which is saving lives alleviating suffering, and increasing self-sufficiency. So today I am working at International Relief and Development, IRD, and our mission statement states to reduce the suffering of the world's most vulnerable groups and provide the tools and resources needed to increase their self-sufficiency. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So we're already tight. I'm a, a monster on time, so I, I will end on time regardless. So. Um, so we only have a few minutes left. Before I go to q and I think it's um, really important. So if anybody on the panel has a, a quick um, comment or response to any other comment, uh, commentators on the panel, I'd like to offer that, that first. Huh? Let's open it up. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, Jerry, so if you just wait for the microphone. Uh, 
Thank you. Terry Miller with the Heritage Foundation, but perhaps more relevant, uh, a 30-year veteran of the Department of State and the Foreign Service. Um, it seems to me there's a little bit of apples and oranges going on here. Um, humanitarian assistance, uh, perhaps it's better if you make a distinction between humanitarian and development assistance. I think people might understand that different, uh, that, that distinction better than this instrumental or uh, intentional kind of, of aid that we're talking about here. Um, Jenny laid out a definition of, of what humanitarian assistance is that is very self-contained and, and really quite limited. Uh, she talks about assistance that's needed to really, uh, to really keep, keep people alive, basically, um, if I can summarize it in that way. And, and if we think of that goal as, as what occupies the humanitarian space, then this whole question about neutrality or not really um, doesn't need to even be happening, I, I would have to say. And, and I think perhaps we're doing everybody a disservice by ha having this debate. Um, because what Jim is talking about um, in, in terms of what his organization does, clearly for me, is, it does not occupy this humanitarian space. Uh, it's development assistance, or it, it, it's assistance clearly provided through and with the assistance of the U.S. military. Um, no one would expect that to be neutral. Um, it, it's not really what we would call humanitarian assistance in the traditional way. Um, so I, I don't even know why that comes up. Maybe it's a good fundraising tool, I think, probably to, to talk about not neutral. Um, yeah. And in fact, AID has gotten in trouble in the past when it has tried to expand the neutrality space to cover its developmental activities. When we're overseas and we're talking about nation building activities or development activities, uh, we don't pretend to be neutral. Um, new, the neutrality principles simply do not apply. They apply when we're talking about humanitarian assistance. So. Um, I really don't understand that, and I, I would just mention one other very slight concern about what Spirit of America does, and I, I very much admire uh, what they do in many aspects, but I do think it raises questions about uh, command and control and, and chief of mission authority in the countries in which we're operating. Um, it really is important that, that something that really is supporting or intimately connected with a U.S. government activity overseas um, well, in the first instance, I'd prefer it be funded by the U.S. government, not by private um, actor, actors, but in any case, it needs to be coordinated and controlled through the military chain of command and through the chief of mission uh, command in the, in the U.S. government. I'm sorry I didn't have a question to ask, but I no, felt actually, those comments were important. Yeah, let me ask both Jim and Jenny to, to do maybe a quick response to that. Well, just on the, the last point, which was, I, I think, maybe your, your smaller one of the, the two, um, everything that we do is coordinated at the country team level and with the uh, chief of mission or DCM. Um, you know, I talk, I give uh, very brief comments with a couple of examples. So that coordination exists every time, uh, everywhere. And I, I guess I would say that um, you know, people have asked on various projects whether uh, something we did was humanitarian assistance or economic assistance. And... Um, you know, and not to be flippant about this point, because I understand that words matter, uh, but our view is, well, it doesn't matter because it's what needed to be done in a particular place and time to help our uh, U.S. personnel and their partners achieve certain objectives. And, you know, each one has different objectives, typically. Uh, but where humanitarian assistance, I think, matters is that, uh, and where, you know, the neutral versus not neutral really does matter, is that um, those principles do not, are not only applied to, I'll say, the, the rather narrow definition of humanitarian assistance that you uh, referred to and the Jenny described. It really refers to much, uh, I'll say most, of how aid and assistance works in the international system. So billions and billions of dollars are applied uh, in the international system according to those principles, really whether they're necessarily strictly humanitarian or, or not. And as a result, uh, and I don't have a quarrel with how organizations operate, by the way. I'm not here to criticize interaction members or any folks. I think there's tremendously courageous and, and uh, valorous work that's done. Uh, but what that does is creates gaps and disconnects in terms of the, the practical application of assistance, whatever kind of uh, label one applies to it, in these environments. And those gaps and disconnects can serve to perpetuate the misery and suffering that we all would seek to alleviate. 
So that's why I think word, words matter. Jane? Um, so I'm, I'm going to take what Terry said, which was uh, in incredibly helpful, and I think you're exactly right. Um, but we should distinguish not between different types of activities, but different desired results from what it is we do. Um, do we have a development goal or a humanitarian goal? Um, and I, I think that Anne's distinction between the fundamental and the instrumental is also quite helpful in that sense. What is your purpose? What is it, what change are you trying to bring about? What, what result are you trying to bring about? Um, and that is how you understand what realm you're operating in and therefore how you need to be able to operate in order to bring about that outcome. Um, so here, um, I actually am, am going to say again, I in fact agree with everything that Anne said. These are not humanitarian problems or indeed you know, humanitarian situations that we're working in. These are fundamentally political problems. These are not neutral spaces. They're intensely, intensely political environments where a huge number of factors are being politically contested with you know, myriad actors who are acting on beha on, on, based on their own interests and, and competing intensely you know, for their own desired outcome in that situation. So we do not, um, but, but going back to sort of the, the, the purpose of what it is you're trying to achieve, we're not trying to solve the political problem. And we desperately want those political problems to be solved, but it's not our job. Our job is, while those political problems are being sorted, to help ensure that people survive. Um, so I think we, we're, we're in agreement about the, the characteristics um, of the context that we're talking about, um, but we are talking about different desired results from different types of action. Nadia, you have a comment? I mean, I think Jenny actually sort of made my point, <laughs> which um, is, I guess I would just disagree that there's a space, I would, your point about what the definition of humanitarianism is a very important one. I would just <coughs> argue it's about this big, and everything else outside of it is, is much bigger, and the outcomes that humanitarian organizations want to achieve, I think can be better and more effectively achieved and more sustainable if the politics are noted up front. So um, I just... That's, that's how I would look at it. And many of the organizations that I looked at that are on a part of Interaction, which is an umbrella group, Jenny knows, she, um, if you look at what they want to achieve, they are not just about delivering water to kids. They are about alleviating suffering, which gets into that more complex space of sustainable outcomes. And so. Andy, you have a good comment? Yeah, just going back to the motivations, what is driving the assistance, I think is the key question. Also, um, where you know we talk about development and humanitarian assistance, that space becomes murky uh, when we have different definitions between the different worlds. And this is what we've been trying to solve. And we're not going to solve it yet because these are legislative issues. So, but I think if we are very honest with each other and decide to just to decide what the lanes are, I think there is a way forward. So, uh, so there's good news and bad news. So the good news is this is a superb uh, job of really kind of putting all the issues on the table and explaining them with awesome clarity. The, the bad news is we actually ran out of time. So my bad for not scheduling eight hours for this. But um, <laughs> not being able to, uh, so I, I will make a, well, first of all, obviously you'll all get invited back. But I'm, I'm <laughs> no, I, no, you know, you know, my one takeaway is obviously we need a part two to this discussion. It's very fruitful and, and, uh, and, and, and we need to kind of walk down the road a little further. So I, I make a commitment that we'll, we'll come back and do this again in the near future. So please join me in thanking our panelists for an amazing. Thank you.